One of the things that I think we as a church need to lean into is the pastoring of the Holy Spirit. And we don't often do that. One of the retreats we had, David Roos, we're doing a worship circle and things start going a little nutty in the room, right? And it was like, there's people crying. I was one of them. I was on the floor crying, like guttural cry, right? And David goes, this is intercessory tears. Do not be scared of it. This is what's happening in the room. It's okay if it's not happening to you, but if it's happening, it's okay. And this is what it is. Let's go with it. And that's powerful. Like yeah. there's so many people that don't understand what's going on. So we need to pastor what's happening. You're listening to the Ferment Podcast, conversations about worship and transformation. Today's guest is Melissa Keller. Melissa is the Director of Events and Project Management for Vineyard Worship. This episode is brought to you by Monk Drums. Monk Drums is a creative desert venture that strives to combine beauty and business as one heartbeat. Monk Drums' main focus is handcrafted wooden drums that allow us to love, assist, and serve all who accompany us on this path. Use the coupon code FermentPod to get 5% off your Monk Drums order. Find them on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Monk Drums. And every Monday, look for hashtag Monk Drum Monday. Speaking from personal experience, Monk Drums are wonderfully crafted and they sound amazing. They've won the best traits of both the djembe and the cajon, and I found them to be incredibly versatile in both the live and studio environment. Check them out at monkdrums.com. This episode is brought to you by our friends at worshipteam.com. Worshipteam.com comes preloaded with over 12,000 songs, with new songs being added all the time. Hillsong, Bethel, Vineyard, Six Steps, Jesus Culture, just to name a few. Service building with Worship Team is a snap, and all the songs are completely legal and licensed. You can also find them on social media, Facebook at worshipteam.com, Twitter at worshipteam, Instagram at worshipteam underscore WT. Visit them at worshipteam.com for a free trial today. Complete worship planning with thousands of songs, easy interface, mobile apps, and legal rights for your church. All you need in one place, worshipteam.com. Today's episode of the Ferment Podcast is brought to you by Harden Coffee, a small batch custom roaster located in the rolling green hills of Kentucky. At Harden, we believe in locating world-class coffee from around the globe and delivering it to your door fresh and roasted to perfection. We specialize in single origin coffees as well as seasonal blends. Coffee is communal. Coffee is culinary. Coffee is art. Visit us today at hardencoffee.com. Hey, what up, everybody? Adam Russell here. You're listening to the Ferment Podcast. I am in my office with another friend. Not just a friend, but someone I work with. Melissa Keller is here today. Hand claps all around. Woo! Hi, Melissa. Hi, Adam. Hey, um, I think a lot of people know who you are, or at least see your face, and they definitely hear your voice at the beginning of this podcast. Why don't you just tell everybody what you do at Vineyard Worship real quick? Yep. So I am the Director of Events and Project Management at Vineyard Worship. So I, yeah. That means you do everything. Yeah. (laughs) That means you do everything. (laughs) I sure do. Uh, That means that if there is a worship leader retreat, a rise boot camp, if something is happening, if a single is released, if a record is made, you're putting your hands on it, right? It all goes through me. That's right. (laughs) Yeah. That's one of the reasons I wanted you to come on here because I think people have seen your face. I think people have met you at registration and check-in at our events. Which I love. That's right. And I think people have probably even maybe shared a meal with you occasionally. Mm, I hope so. But I also have this feeling that some people don't know you in the way that uh, people who work closer with you know you. And we just want to like find out who the heck you are and what you do. Awesome. Can we do that? We can. All right, Melissa, let's get into this. Where were you born? Well, I was born in California. So you're a true Californian girl. I'm a true Californian. I think I'm third generation Californian. Grandparents, parents. Yeah, I think. And now me and my kids. So I think that's kind of rare. I don't know. I've heard. Maybe. Maybe not. Yeah. That means, yeah, that means you guys are deeply connected to whatever that California vibe is. Yep. That California vibe. Yeah. (laughs) It is. Hippie vibe. California vibe. Pioneer. That's right. Family comes over, you know. That's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You go. Everybody who's in California, there's a sense of adventure in them. Yes, exactly. We're going. Were you guys always from Southern California? Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. we were, yep. All born right. and raised. My dad, I believe, was born in Los Angeles. Okay. And my grandparents uh, graduated. Are you guys Dodger fans? Oh, yes. 
So go no, blue. So no angels. No angels. I, I will hold back my words on that, even though I guess different leagues, national, American, yes. but still. No, no. Los yeah. Angeles. What is See, it? This is this angels is, of Anaheim. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is <laughs> this is my take on fandom. You're not a true fan if there's space in your heart for sometimes accepting another team. Okay. Well, I know that's a little controversial, but I just think if you're a true fan, it's it's your team 100% all the time. Right. And death to all the other teams. That's right. Okay. That makes me feel better because that's how I feel. That's how I feel. That's how I feel. It's Dodgers. It's just Dodgers. Okay, good. Dodgers go, fans. Go blue. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. Um, did you grow up a believer? I did. I grew up in the church. Um, my dad was in high school and met um, some gentleman in high school, a man by the name of Terry Butler, who some of us know. Oh, Terry. Terry and my dad uh, went to school together and Randy, uh, Terry's brother, they were all in school together. And one of them, they were in band together. Okay. And my dad plays drums. He's a drummer. He was drummer in the band. And one day they invited him to come play drums at church. And he's been there. He was there ever since, not there now, but was at this certain church ever since. And so I... Um, he met my mom, they got married, they were part of that church, and I grew up in the church, which was the Arcadia Vineyard. It was before that a Assembly of God or Church of God. Sure. So it was like an adoption. Into it was the an vineyard. adoption in, in 1986, okay. I think. So for me, I was very, very, very little. So I've been vineyard my whole way. life, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. So you're one of those people who you didn't have some sort of a church history before, mm-hmm. but you've actually grown up in the vineyard. Yeah, I have. Yeah, that's actually a key thing because at least in the history of the vineyard, mm-hmm. everybody who first came to the vineyard either was an unbeliever or had some other church experience. Mm. And now all of those people who made the vineyard have found mates, raised children. And there's this whole generation now that's sort of coming up and their entire frame for being a Christian is really a vineyard frame. Mm -hmm. And you're one of those people. I am one of those people. Yeah. Okay. Did you guys, did you guys play music as a family? No. So. Because I know you, you, you lead worship, you play piano. I do. I do. Well, I've been around music my whole life. Um, So my dad, the drummer, uh, after high school, uh, Terry and Randy Butler formed a band called One Truth. Shout out to One Truth. (laughs) So they were a band in the 70s and 80s, a Christian revival band, and they toured and they had songs on the radio from what I understand, Okay, I think. And they all had kids all around the same time. And I'm one of those kids. And so we all grew up together and majority of everyone is musical. And so it's just kind of, it's been a part of us. Um, So we have that side of it along with... um, Growing up in the church, and I remember being around my dad when he would play at the conferences um, in the 90s in the vineyard, and he would go to conferences, and these guys would all go, and we would just go with him because we're kids and would hang out. Um, but I remember at some point uh, feeling so drawn to them. Like before it was a, we go because we're the kids and we have to, but at some point really early on, it became I want to go where no longer would my sister go or other people. I just kept going because I was drawn to it. So I remember going. uh, Is this like middle school? This is middle school, maybe even a little, a hair younger, but around middle school. Yeah. Yeah. And just being so drawn to it. I just want to be there. And now I look back and go, well, that's the Holy Spirit. Like I was drawn to where something was. God was calling you. Absolutely. And so I would go with him wherever he went to all these different conferences. And I would sit in the green room where I would sit outside and, and just absorb. So like a sponge, I would just be a part and I would absorb all that was happening there, you know, and just follow him around. Yeah. I think that's pretty normal. In fact, I may have mentioned it on the podcast a time or two in other episodes, but that window when kids are in middle school, it's just such a killer window for um, the work of God. Mm -hmm. Uh, kids really do at some level start taking ownership of their faith sometime in middle school. Mm. And so I've just heard this story so many times from different people. That's when they really started choosing to go be a part of something or wanting to, or becoming awake to the fact that maybe God had some sort of a call in their life or becoming awake to the fact that 
they could lead worship. Mm. They didn't have to just be someone who was led in worship, but maybe they could do that or wanted to do that and start playing guitar. And mm -hmm. yeah, so I think that's pretty normal. And, you know, if there's worship leaders listening to this, and of course there are, <clears throat> excuse me, of course there are. Gosh, we just got to be looking for those middle school kids, don't we? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is so I would go and just be, right? Hang around. But music coming out of me and me being a part of it didn't actually happen until I was in my mid 20s. Really? Yeah. Why? Um, I was super shy. Like you, you just didn't, you didn't talk much? Like, like what kind of shyness? Like you were, you were shy musically or you, like just socially in general, you're kind of a shy person. Well, I loved people being around people. I think I was really insecure. Okay. So I think that that made me more shy. So maybe it's more insecure. Yeah. I was insecure and I remember... Um, but I've never experienced you as being a shy person. No. I mean, I haven't known you forever, but like... No. I've never... You've never been like a, a wallflower. No. That actually has been a series of events that have totally changed my life and okay. made me who I am today and yes. has taken me out of that and bring brought me into a place of confidence and knowing who I am and what God's called me to. Yeah. Like it's been a series of events. Um, okay. So, but there was, you're around it. And then there's this many years where you're with your father and Terry and Randy and this collection of musicians, you want to be there, mm -hmm. but you're just sort of like insecure and shy. And so you're not, and you don't do any music till you're Nope. Mid 20s. Nope. So no music. Um, Did you play piano before? Nope. You started in your mid 20s. I started in my mid 20s. Yep. Okay. I played, no, I tried to play the flute when I was in junior high and I got real dizzy real quick. And so I figured I probably should give <laughs> what, that just up. Just the air? Yeah. <laughs> just, you know, not, not using the instrument the right way. Hilarious. <laughs> I would get lightheaded. And I'm like, okay, done with that. Not for me. Not for me. I did actually start by playing bass. Bass was my first instrument. Really? Actually, I started running can you, sound. Can you still play bass at all? I could if I picked it up and went back to it, you Got know, it. like went back to it. Got but it. I started on bass in high school, okay. end of high school. High school. That was my first instrument. And I played... Your dad, was, your dad was just trying to put a rhythm section together, wasn't he? He's right. like, I'll play drums. Melissa, you play bass. Right. I don't remember why I picked up bass, but maybe it's because there was a need. Because, you know, I'm a two. There's a need. Yeah, I'm going <laughs> to probably what happened. That. Yeah. <laughs> There's a need. I'll fill it. Also, in the, in the mid-90s, though, there was, a, there was a girl band called The Breeders. Oh. I did not know this band. What? I did have... But I hung out with all guys. Okay. And it was '90s dudes, you know, like yeah. like you that have, grunge you rock grunge garage band thing. Did you? I did had you a grunge. grunge up? Oh yeah, yeah, I totally did. Like how grungy did you? Grunge? Well, for a girl, but yeah, yeah, I yeah. still all my friends were guys, and they were all into all kinds of crazy grunge music and Foo Fighters and all that stuff. Yeah. Love Pearl Jam, yes. all that. So I was one of the guys. So I would just listen to all that stuff. K Rock, if anyone's from California or if that goes beyond, I'm not sure. But K Rock was what I listened to. Yeah. And they all had a band. And so I think I don't I wasn't in a band with them, but kind of coming out of that, I I forget how it came about, but I picked up the bass and our worship leader at the time taught me how to play. And I played a few times. And but here's what happened is then that transformation of like what God was calling me to beyond that started to happen. So I remember playing for a little while and going, I can't sing and play bass. Like it's really hard to do mm. unless you're Paul McCartney or Sting. I'm not like them. So I, I should move on. <laughs> so, so I picked up the guitar. My mom, actually, she played 12 string guitar. That's, Never. A, that's a very, that's a very Southern California yeah. hippie mom thing. And to do. the banjo. But She's she, a, she was a banjist. Yeah, but she never played it around us. This was before we were born, but we had him in the garage. So I picked up the guitar, 12 string. Mom, would you teach me? She showed me three chords and I could not get it because this is 12 string guitar. Yeah. So I learned three chords and I gave that up. And this is like years. This is like a very slow progression. Yeah. And it came to, um, uh, then I gave a, a long break. I didn't do anything. And I would just go to our rehearsals uh, for our worship team for a long time and just hang out. Again, drawn to it, drawn to music. And um, our worship leader, well, no, I would just hang out with them. And I learned to run sound because I was there. And why not? So our worship leader's like, oh, yeah, I used to do this, this. So I would run sound, it, like at the rehearsals and then sometimes on Sunday mornings and just kind of to yeah. be a part, you know. And looking back, it's weird. It was like five, my dad and his 
you know, four or five other friends in the worship team and then me just yeah. hanging out every Thursday night. And um, after a while, so then they started going and playing different churches. They did a few different things. And and um, I remember coming home from something that I just went with them to, and we're in the car with the worship leader and my dad and me. And I said, you know, I'd really love to sing on the worship team one day. And I literally, it came out of my mouth and I, <gasps> I freaked out. Why did I say that? <laughs> yeah. And he said, okay, well, come on Thursday. We'll, we'll try it out. And I freaked out the whole week, freaked out. Like, what have I done? What yeah. have I done? It's going to be terrible. And I remember, so he's like, okay, time to sing right on that Thursday. And I go up to sing and he picked the song Breathe, which I love that song. Yeah. We all love the song Breathe. That's right. But for some odd reason, I remember having a, ch I'm, I'm a harmony p person, like I, boy bands. Okay. I'm yep. we're going all over the place. That's but fine. Boy that's bands fine. were also my thing Okay. in the nineties. So that's where you learn harmony. Backstreet Boys. Right? Oh, I can sing all kinds of harmony. And it's things. Was there a boy band called 98 Degrees? There was. But okay. it started with New Kids on the Block for NKOTV. me. NKOTV? Yeah. So okay. that's where I learned harmony was Got from it. New Kids on the Block. Got it. So I would sing harmony all the time, just, you know, in general and at home. And I remember struggling with the harmony for Breathe randomly. I don't know why. And he picked that song. And again, I freaked out. But when I opened my mouth to sing, shaking and trembling, out came the harmony perfectly. Yeah. And he's like, oh, okay, you're on. I was like, what just happened? But to me, I knew it was beyond me, you know? Yeah. There was something else going on. So I I sang on the worship team and I would sing with them. I, I would sing about 12 inches off the microphone every Sunday, like Got it. way far off. And they would continuously tell me, sing in the microphone, Yeah, sing in the microphone. So the, again, this is still a manifestation of your own insecurity. Oh yeah, like but you're there, hugely you're insecure. You're taking steps, mm -hmm. but still, you're just so insecure. You're not really even in the microphone. Yeah, hugely yeah. insecure and scared. But yet, I had people around me who believed in me and yeah. did not give up on me. Who? Um, our worship leader, his name's Mike Young or okay. Michael Young. Yeah. Um, my dad yeah. never gave up on me. Um, at this time, at the time. Uh, our sound man was Mitchell Butler, who was our pastor's son. Oh my gosh, love Mitchell. Yeah, good friend. And he would be always Melissa sing in the microphone, and and our friend Tom Redu. And so this is Terry had left our uh, this church, and he'd been gone for ten or fifteen years, I think, or he'd moved on to Vineyard Pomona. So I'm at Vineyard Arcadia, and so it's these this group of guys really, and other people in my church, everybody in my church was supportive. Our pastor, Floyd Butler, another Butler, very supportive, always encouraging me, despite the fact that I was so insecure and it took me so long. So I'm doing this forever. How long did you, how long did you sing with the microphone way away from I your mouth? I want to say it was like a year. Yeah. <laughs> like it was so long. No. And we'd sing in those three part harmonies, three ladies yeah. on microphones and you have your part and you, yeah, you just stay sing there, your part. sing your part. Super supported, but yeah, super insecure. And then eventually it turned to our worship leader would give me songs. Okay, you sing this song. Yeah. And as I finally warmed up and, or we share a song. And, and so that started, that was probably another year. So your transformation from going to extremely insecure, non-participatory to singing, mm -hmm. but still kind of like very insecure, your transformation into being a worship leader was... Slow, very slow, uh, gradual, bit by bit, tons of support around you, tons of support. I think people need to hear this kind of thing because I agree. Probably there are people who are listening right now who are either worship leaders or they want to be worship leaders and they're very insecure and they don't know what to do. And maybe they're even a little frustrated that there hasn't been some ministry time knockout session that cured all their insecurities and made them a power performer mm -hmm. in you know, one prayer or one moment. But part of what I hear in your story is that part of God's grace is slow, gradual, bit by bit, maybe over the course of a year or two with lots of support around. Yep. Yeah. And people who made space for me. Yeah. So I didn't have all this experience. I was learning and I was willing to work and I was willing to grow, right? So that's a big point is I was trying and I was growing and I was putting in the work, even though it was slow. But um, what I learned for me, the the bar was higher. So because they were all really talented, 
I could grow faster by being in that environment around people who were way better than me. But my growth musically, once I got, um, once I got more secure, my growth happened quicker. Does that make sense? Yeah, because that bar was higher around no. those with those people that did support me. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. I mean, I'm 41 now. Mm -hmm. I have at least for the last 12 years, mostly done the lead pastor thing. Still very connected to Vineyard Worship during all those years. But for years before that, I was worship leader here at this same church for about 10 years. And then before that, I led on teams here and there and whatnot. But um, my own musical journey and progression was similar in that it was bit by bit and it was slow. But in my world, I had no one around me. Mm. So we're, we're, we live here in Campbellsville, Kentucky. We're kind of like on an island, right? And my brother-in-law and I, we talk about this all the time because we kind of came up together and it was very DIY. Mm -hmm. So we didn't, we didn't know what we didn't know. Mm -hmm. We didn't know that there were ways to play better or that there's just certain, certain rules about like how drum and bass work. And we were just very interested in music and musos. And so my, my, my journey is slow, progressive, marked by failure and, um, you know, school of hard knocks kind of a thing, right? But now here at the church in Campbellsville anyway, there's this group of musicians who are, they're freaking incredible. Mm -hmm. And so my son has come up with them. Yeah. And he's 17 now, you know, shout out to my son, River. Yeah. But he's 17 now, he's a drummer and he's an electric guitar player. And he's way better than I have ever been at both of those things because he's been around people who were amazing. Mm -hmm. And even if they were, even if they were not specifically teaching him something, being in that atmosphere, yeah, it just turns things on for you in a way that, you know, just can't come any other way almost. It does. It does. Yeah. When that, it, there's some other level. And if you're willing to, you can, you can just like, oh, I need to go up. Like you reach it quicker being around it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think it totally makes sense. And Part of what I hope people hear in what you're sharing, too, is that maybe two different ways here. Like one, if you're at a church where there are some really good musicians and maybe you even are a really good musician, maybe the worship ministry is fairly put together, that we always need to keep our eyes open for people who are not at our level. Yes. And making room on our stages and in our rehearsals for development. Yes. Just, and, and really the development can simply be bringing someone in, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Hey, why don't you come to rehearsal? And the only thing I want you to do is sing BGVs. Mm -hmm. yep. Like we're not, you don't, you're not playing on Sunday morning. Yep. But come, come be with us. Yep. Amazing musicians. Mm -hmm. Sing BGs. Yeah. So, I, you know, that, that would be one thing. And then I hope the other thing people hear in this is maybe you're at a new church plant and you don't have really any good musicians. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're alone leading worship, or maybe you've slowly attracted a few people, but everybody's kind of at a basic beginner level. This would be a, this would be a good space to even maybe invite somebody in who's at a different level than you, mm -hmm. or go visit someone who's close to you who maybe is at a different level, because just that interaction, it changes people. It does. It does. And I will, I will say, so that beginning time where I was singing BGVs, I actually went to the rehearsals only for a very long time. Like that was my uh, learning where I, where I grew. I did that for a very long time before I actually sang on the Sunday. And I was around super talented people that would, okay, let's stop here. Try this. Like they would stop a rehearsal to work with me on stuff, you know, yeah. or, and make the time to help, not just like here, follow along, but they would make the time to help me and, and point me in the right direction and, and maybe fix some things or point out some things. And that was huge, yeah, huge those, for me. Those weekly rehearsal times, they can actually do two or three things at once, right? Right. So we could all learn a song, but at the same time, we could develop one or two musicians. Yes. Even if they're not going to play on Sunday morning. Yep. That's part of what I hear in your story. It's Absolutely. great. Absolutely. Really Absolutely. Great. When did you start playing piano? Yeah, so that's fun too. Uh, <laughs> so I'm in this environment where, so now I'm leading out songs, right, without an instrument, which yeah. is fine. That's yeah, you fine. got a band. I got a band, and they've told me, don't worry, we've got your back. Totally cool. Totally okay. So then I meet my now husband, Scott, and we met 
Um, that's a whole different story. So I meet Scott. Scott's a guitar player. He's a guitar player. Did he always play electric guitar? Uh, he started on drums, actually. Really? He started on drums because I think they didn't have a drummer. So he started on percussion and then drums and then uh, is a great electric guitar player. He was in a band in Seattle, the whole thing. Um, so I met Scott and Scott had come to our church and was a part of our church and um, playing guitar. And, and um, one day he said to me, why don't you play an instrument? I'm like, well, I, they, I don't know. <laughs> and he said, you need to play an instrument. And I said, they didn't say I had to play an instrument. <laughs> and he said, if you're going to lead worship, you need an instrument and challenged me. And I'll tell you, I'm forever grateful that he did. How did it feel when they, when you were challenged in that moment? I got feisty and said, well, they didn't tell me that I had to. <laughs> yeah. But, but I mean, beyond, and, beyond feisty, okay, did, okay. It, did it bring up insecurity again or did it? Yeah. Did it? Yeah. Did it I make got you feel insecure like, and scared. Yeah. And I think mostly scared, like what? And, and surprised, like, wait, what? But, but scared and intimidated. Yeah. So my next step was to go, but, but I stood up to the challenge and yes. I went, okay, here's what I did next though. I said, what instrument does nobody else play right now in our church so that nobody else can judge me? <laughs> well, you didn't have a piano player? No, not since Terry. We didn't have a piano player, not since Terry left. That's hilarious. Uh, and that was 15 years. What are the chances? Right. No piano player. So this is how I came about my instrument <laughs> after trying the 12 string and you know, all that. Yeah. You didn't want to be a worship flautist? No. <laughs> so no, yeah. Worship. No, no. Um, so no piano player in our church and there hadn't been for years. So I got this old Clavinova okay. Yamaha from okay. my grandma okay. for free. She gave it to me and I put it in my room and it sounded terrible, by the way. What? Clavinova. I don't know. Tell me what that is. It's I have no like, idea. It's an electric piano that would play itself if you pushed a button. Okay. And so you could tell what songs to play and it would just... Okay. And we would, my sister and I would just push a button. It would play like when we were growing up. But it sounds like, not like a good, like whirly. It's like electric piano that you don't want to hear. It like, just was terrible. Like bad digital. Oh, bad. It was yeah. real bad. Yeah. So she gave it to me for free. I had it in my room. And this is what we call what Scott refers to as the wood shedding time. Yes. So I buy a couple of DVDs or no, at the time VHS, it was VHS yeah. videos and a couple books that I found about like, what is this instrument? I had no idea. I didn't grow up with piano lessons, I, none of that. Yeah. So this is, this is basically before YouTube. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, there is no YouTube. Right. No YouTube. You just said VHS. There's people listening to this podcast who are like, I have no idea, have no idea what that even right. is. <laughs> it yeah. was before DVD, before YouTube. Yes, yeah, old. That no, means no, I'm old. Yeah. I love this. <laughs> so I put in my VHS in my bedroom. And for three months, I followed this, this video of this woman who would give you a little lesson and kind of learned it. Just I taught myself, right? So I taught myself the basic general idea. And then through this mutual friend of ours at this church at this time, I stumbled upon this girl who was a piano teacher and uh, met this girl right at the right time. And she's like, oh, I'll teach you piano. So I I went to her for three months to get the foundations, like Sir Cliffiths and all the, yeah. you know, theory behind the piano. And it was great. It was wonderful. And I remember after about three months, um, I brought her this song that was, I think it was Bring Me Back. It's an old vineyard song. Catherine no. Scott sang it. Mm -hmm. It's not too old. Um, and it's so beautiful. I love the song. So it was really the first I don't know, a song that was mine to own. And um, I said, what's she playing here? How does she do this? And and she went, oh, I don't know. Like, because it's a feel thing, right? It's a, just a feel. It's, it's the way that she felt it. And so I went, okay, well, my next phase is to, I need to get to that point where I can close my eyes and just feel it and just play. Does that make sense? Yeah. And playing without thinking about... Playing without thinking, yeah. yeah. You, you can just trust your hands. Yeah. You, you've done the work. Yeah. You have muscle memory. Yeah. Yeah. You're not so, searching for the cord. This happens so quickly. So within six months, I was then leading worship from the piano. Got it. At my church. Yeah. Within six months. Okay. Can you remember the first time you led? I can. Okay. How oh, was yeah. that? Were you nervous? Okay. 
so nervous. Okay. And I had also, how many people went to your church when this was happening? We had a hundred 20 was kind of always our average. And I think we had just merged two churches together. So this might've been maybe a little bit bigger at that time. Two churches has merged together. So we had kind of a different band at this point. Yeah. Um, But my dad was playing drums with me and Scott was playing guitar. And this other guy, Jared. Were you dating Scott at that time? I think we were married at this time. Okay, cool. So so you had lots of security. People. Lots of security. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and this guy, Jared, I remember, and then probably this guy, Tom. Um, so I remember playing and they were so supportive. They're like, don't worry, we've got your back. Just play the chords. It'll be great. And I remember going through the set and I remember I played, I played Holy and Anointed One yes. as the last song of my set. And I told them, do not leave me, but like, don't leave me. You have to stay with me because our- what, what did that mean when you were saying, don't leave me? So, you know, when we ebb and flow as musicians and yeah. we bring it down and that's a natural place to bring it. Mm. I said, do not leave me in this moment. Yeah. Don't leave me hanging. And they said, don't worry. We won't. They left. <laughs> so they, I'm they, le- they, they left me. Yeah, they left you hanging. So I'm leading this song and it is totally natural flow. And it comes down to this really intimate moment and it's holy and anointed one. And we're kind of like landing the plane. It's real intimate. And it's right. What they're doing is completely right. Yeah. But they left me. And but, in my brain, I go, said, don't leave me. <laughs> they left me. <laughs> so I, I froze and I hit some funky, weird chord. And I, 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 and then I fixed it. And then I finished the song. I prayed. I went off the stage. I went out of the room. I went into the bathroom. I locked the door and I cried. <laughs> Why did you lock the door and cry? Because of the bad, the bad cord? Because of the bad cord. This is, I came out finally and my, my husband and Jared are outside waiting and I'm like, I ruined their worship. <laughs> yeah, get out of here. That's so funny. It's so not true. Yeah. And they said, no, we all make mistakes. You just come back around the next time and you kill it the next time and no one will remember. That's which right. is a good tip. By that the is way. true. It's a great tip. So that was my first experience leading worship. And really quickly after I led worship at a women's retreat all by myself. I mean, it was like quick yeah. where I was then doing things from then on, you yeah. know? One other thing is when my dad was playing with me, he sat back there and cried like the whole time because that's my dad. He's just soft and mushy and amazing. And, but he said, when you led worship, you led like Terry. I knew where you were going and I knew what was going to happen. You led like Terry. Well, Terry hadn't been at our church for 15 years, but there were seeds planted in me from watching him growing up and watching how he led. And he's the only person I'd seen leading from piano. But there was a seed planted in me. And I, for me, at the right time, God watered that seed and that plant grew. Yeah. So that was a gift, you know? Yeah, no, it's true. And especially because all those years that you had gone with your dad and rehearsals and those things, mm-hmm. they actually do. Mm-hmm. They actually do change who you are. Mm-hmm. And it gives you the really subtle understanding of, what worship is like, how to play with the band, how to communicate, even nonverbal communication mm-hmm. with your band during a worship set. All those things can be received osmotically. Absolutely. It yeah. was. It was like a sponge. It was just there. So I've got these tools now that I can access, even though I, I had no idea that that was happening. Maybe shift gears and talk about something really different. Yes. Because I know this is also a part of who you are, and these are the gifts that I've seen you operate in. Um, I know you're a Holy Spirit person. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where did that start? Because, and by Holy Spirit person, I mean, you and I've done a lot of events together, and I've seen you do lots of ministry, especially lots of prophetic ministry, mm-hmm. and you've got great gifts there. And I'm just very interested in where that started and kind of how that took root in your life? Well, um, I think growing up in the vineyard, right? Yeah. Since I was small, it's something I saw. It's not, our church, because we're an adoption, 
we didn't operate in the same way. Like when I would visit Anaheim, it would not kind of, we wouldn't operate the same way. Mm -hmm. Um, but we believed in the gifts of the spirit and, and we're learning and growing in that as I was young and growing. Um, but I, I think that going to the conferences and things with my dad was a big part of that. Just seeing it happen, right? In these conference settings and seeing what was going on. Okay. So when it would happen in a conference setting and by it, I mean, when there would be a powerful ministry time or a powerful Holy mm -hmm. Spirit moment, how did you feel about that? <laughs> well, it varied. It varied. Uh, a lot of the time I remember feeling the presence of God and, and wanting to be there. Like, I just, yeah. I don't know what's happening, but this I want to be there. This is attractive. This is great. I'm right where I'm supposed to be. This feels like home. Right. But there were also some scary moments. Like, uh, define uh, scary. So I remember my dad going to something with David Roos in Pasadena. Okay. A long time ago. And I went and I'm, I'm there. And there's no one else with me. It's just me and I'm with my dad. So I'm sitting there and you guys, I can't remember the name of it, but it was like pretty famous, whatever we were, where we're at for being pretty like wild, pr pretty wild. Yeah. So I'm sitting there and then all of a sudden screaming starts happening. Okay. And like deliverance, deliverance screaming? was happening all yeah. around. And I remember my, I think it was my dad or someone going, that's okay. It's just deliverance. There's a demon coming out of that person. No big deal. It's like, <laughs> it feels like a big deal. Okay. It feels like yeah, a big yeah. deal. Like yeah. I'm in, I'm scared for my life right now, but okay. Yeah. But but I was around it, you know, like yeah. it was just kind of around it. And and I remember um, also from being really small, the kind of person I am is is believing the things that people told me about Jesus, right? So when they said, you can pray and talk to him about anything, I did, right? So I remember being really small and I remember losing something very important to me. It was like a purse or something when I was real little. And, and looking everywhere, being undone by it and going, wait, I can pray about this. Yes. And I shut my eyes and I had a vision. I had a picture in my mind of where that purse was. And sure enough, I went up to my room, looked under the pile of clothes, and there it was. So from a small child, God would speak to me that way. And I remember my first um, uh, like a word for somebody else was around this, what was it? It was when I was high school, I think, okay. and seeing like a vision, like a, for someone and being so nervous, but, but like d giving it anyway, does that yes. make sense? Yeah. And so I think because I was around it, I just knew that it was just a part of me. Yeah. So, so you kind of grew up around Holy Spirit moments. Lots of them were very attractive. Some were a little scary. Mm -hmm. The David Ruiz moment was a little scary. Yeah. You, I hope you hear that, David. And then it was, it wasn't David, no. but he was leading worship. That's right. But then also at the same time, there were these moments where you're having like visions. Yeah. Yeah. Can we just unpack that for a minute? Because, because some people who are listening to this are probably thinking, well, that's very normal. And then other people, this may be new to them. Mm -hmm. Talk to me when you say vision, what do you mean? Like you're seeing it inside of your mind or, or are you seeing it sort of like outside of your body? So there's been actually different ways. So in losing my purse, it was, I closed my eyes and I had a vision, a picture in my mind. And yeah. so that's actually often how God speaks to me. Oftentimes I'm closing my eyes when I lead worship because I see visions in my mind. I'll yeah. get that a lot. And that's very normal for me. And it has been since I was this small child. Yeah. Um, but there are some times where it happens to where I'm seeing it at, on someone or, or in real life kind of thing, if, that, if that's more. Like the first one I remember having for someone else, it was like I, there was a guy leading worship in our church. And um, you know how when you've been in the water too much and there's chlorine and things get foggy around yeah. people after you get out of the water? So that was happening for this worship leader, but but only him. It was like my eyes had chlorine in them, but only when I looked at him, there was this fog around him. What did you think that meant? So I had, at the time I had no idea, I thought my, something was wrong with my eyes and I kept blinking and it wouldn't go away. And then I felt like it was, there's a fog around you, but it's not deep. You'll get out of it soon. That's what I heard. Mm. And I was supposed to share it with him. And I went up in fear and trembling and shared this with this person. And he just said, okay. But two years later, he comes run. he finds me, comes running up and goes, oh my gosh, that word you had, you had no idea. I'm like, 
I had no idea. Yeah. And you didn't help me out at the time no. either, buddy. Thank you. <laughs> no. Yeah. But that's how it works, right? We yeah. just deliver it. But, but so it's happened in various ways. Most often though, it will be, I'm closing my eyes and I see something like, like a picture, a picture in my mind. And that's, that's been consistent throughout your Very life. Very consistent. Yeah. I think that's important because mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit talks to us in lots of different ways. He does. Uh-huh. Yeah. Sometimes I get pictures, but I often don't. Mm -hmm. In fact, when I feel like the Holy Spirit is speaking to me, it, it often is more of a feeling. It's like, I just know that I know, Yeah. which is the dumbest way to describe it. And I know it isn't even all that helpful other than there's just various ways that God interacts with us. There is. I think it's, and I think it's interesting that God mostly interacts with you at some kind of spirit visual level. It's very visual. My dad's a designer, graphic designer. Okay. So I'm a very visual person. So I think that's part of it. But um, so it's very visual. But as we grow, God can do it a, like a bunch of different ways. So like when I'm leading worship, it'll be those pictures in my mind. Um, or in recent years, he started kind of growing it and changing it. And it's kind of new and different a lot of the time. So sometimes I'm looking at like a chord chart and it's like a line of a song is highlighted and almost jumps off the page. And then he'll, like he said, this line is for that person. And he'll show me that person in the room. And so he'll use it like so that. So these things have happened. To you. They've happened. All yeah. kinds of stories. Yeah. Can, can we talk about the interaction of the Holy Spirit and worship leading? Can we talk about that yeah. a little bit more? Because mm -hmm. that's very interesting. Because I think a lot of times, even in the vineyard, we put together our sets. Mm -hmm. Maybe we have a rehearsal, we get the band, we work on learning parts, mm -hmm. we get an intro, mm -hmm. we learn the turnaround, mm -hmm. the guitar player learns the line, we have a we have a we have an arrangement, mm -hmm. right? And then we have a set. But then and by the way, I think all that's really good. Absolutely. We should, 100%. We, should, we should do all of that, right? Yes, we should. And at the same time, what I'm hearing from you is maybe that in the middle of the set, God shows you something. Mm -hmm. Okay. Talk to me more about that. And then what do you do? Yeah. So it could be in the middle of a set or even before. So, um, but in the middle of a set, I often, so it could be like that, that phrase is jumping yeah, is, out, it, right? What are you going to do? You're going to sing it more? Right. We sing it more, but sometimes I'll do prayers. So something will jump off or jump off the page and it'll be, um, let's, I'm going to pray this out to yeah. even speak it out and say, I feel that the Lord is blah. So a lot of times, so mine's, you're just pastoring that. I do. I do that a lot. I, yeah. I pastor so you're gonna it. Leave, and say we're going to sing together. Yep. But maybe God has shown you something. Yeah. Maybe you saw something on the page, or maybe God is just showing something in the room. Yep. So then you're going. You communicate that through. I do. I and oftentimes it will be a prayer, or I will say something. That's what I do quite often. Um, sometimes though, I will hear we need to sing this as a church again. Yeah. And so even though we've practiced the song this way, in the moment, you are feeling that the Lord is saying, sing this again. Yeah. And so it will be that. Let's let's repeat this. And you communicate it. But oftentimes for me, it's the Lord is showing me something that's going on, or He's showing me something in the room. Like I had a picture once recently at our church, and I saw um, a giant Jesus. <laughs> Yeah. Giant Jesus walking down our um, aisleway and just touching people and touching people. And it's like the Lord is here and he is touching people, yeah. you know, and he's touching us. And, it, and I'll and even communicate. And what do you think the giant part means? <laughs> uh, to me, it means a giant, trustworthy, like able. powerful, able, able Jesus. Yeah, yes. absolutely. That is Strong. here. That is here for us. And he's bigger than us way bigger than us. Amen. So, and I'll communicate, Jesus is here. And some of you are experiencing him touching you right now. Like yeah. I, one of the things that I think we as a vineyard and we as a church need to lean into is the pastoring of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And we don't often do that. I don't think some do. Absolutely. But I think we can lean into it more. Like I think you and Annabeth do this great. It's, it, and I think it's important. I think more people need to do it. Like, um, at the one of the retreats we had, David Roos, we're doing a worship circle and uh, things start going a little nutty in the room, right? Yeah. And it was like, there's people crying. I was one of them. I was on the floor crying, like guttural cry, right? And David goes, this is inter intercessory 
tears. This is what this is right now. Do not be scared of it. This is what's happening in the room. It's okay if it's not happening to you, but if it's happening, it's okay. And this is what it and is. Let's go with it. And that's powerful. Like yeah. there's so many people that don't understand what's going on. So we need to pastor what's happening, yeah. you know? And remember Mark James? Yeah. In the UK? Yeah, like, it's ridiculous. The room went nuts in this uh, retreat in the UK that Adam and I both were at. It's the most it's the most powerful vineyard meeting I've been to in six years. Same here. Yeah. Same here. So powerful. And Mark James, um, it was a powerful worship time. And somebody spoke out in tongues. Mm -hmm. And Mark goes, The Bible says that wherever someone speaks in tongues, there's an interpreter. Let's so wait. we wait. We wait. One of you interprets. And we waited and waited. And I'm standing in the very back of the room by the guy who's running the slides. And all of a sudden he puts out in the loudest, strongest voice, the translation of what yeah. that was. And it was so powerful to me that he pastored what was happening in that room. And I think we need... Made space for it. Yeah, make space, but pastor it, you yeah. know, and, and tell people what's happening. Does that make sense? Well, and yes, it totally makes sense. And the other thing that I would say about this, I've seen you do it and, and many others, is that pastoring these moments, it doesn't diminish the power of the moment. No, mm-mm. It, it, it in, in fact, it increases them. Mm -hmm. You would think that it would go, there's a sense in which sometimes we might think, oh, this is going to make it more awkward mm -hmm. or, or it's, um, it's going to diminish the power. It's like, if you have to explain a joke, it, it's not funny, mm -hmm. but the opposite is true mm -hmm. in the Holy Spirit ministry. Oftentimes I, and it doesn't have to be long explanations either, No, but just the tiniest pastoral touch of yep. explaining or creating some sort of a container for something. Mm -hmm. I think it. I think it communicates um, hospitality for the spirit. Mm -hmm. I think it communicates hospitality for the people who are in the room. Absolutely. Creates a sense of safety. Mm -hmm. And in that world, many times makes the moment more powerful. Yeah. yeah. And rather than it being about an individual, then it, it is for, it can be for them, but it's it's for the room. It welcomes the room into what's happening. Even, you know? if it's, even if it's for someone, yeah. like to use your words there, if it was for some one person, maybe God is showing you something as the worship leader for someone. If you begin to pastor it in that moment, if it feels appropriate, all of a sudden what was for one person can become for all of us. Right? Yeah. Like, or, or we can all be a part of one person getting what they need that night yeah. or something. Yeah. It's like, there's this invitational component. There's a, um, then there's like a, just, I don't know where it just takes any, for anyone who's got nervousness or anxious, it just takes all that away, hopefully for them too, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. So how often do you get things from God while you're leading worship? Oh, every, I would say every time. And, but recently what um, has been happening, so I'll get it during, but as you grow and change, you know, it changes. So quite often it's in my um, preparation during the week and my preparation beforehand that I start hearing the Lord speak, right? And like I, when you're just thinking about what when, songs are you going to play. Mm -hmm. So when I'm prepping my sets, I will have a song, and this has happened since I started leading worship. I will have a song like literally stand out to me, and I'm sure lots of people experience it. And I feel like this is the song that we have to sing this week. It's the anchor. Yeah, this is our anchor. And we build everything around it. And you it. build everything around it. So yeah. I'll have that. And then... Do you play the songs during the week? I do. Yeah. Absolutely. And Does God speak to you during those moments? Yes. Yes. A hundred percent. And then you start feeling what's going on that's beyond just kind of the song. And then you hear things coming out of it. Like, oh, I can do this out of that because there's something going on here, you know? Um and it frees you up. And then on top of that, even while I'm just getting ready, like kind of like, you know, get my stuff together, I'm praying and going, what are you doing, Lord? And and I'll hear him speak to me or or give me scripture or, or, or kind of like say, there's people who are struggling with whatever it is, trust today or something. Like, let's press into that. You know, like I, I start to get those things as I'm prepping. Well, what I love about what you're sharing right now is you're sharing an ethos or, or a way of viewing worship that is conversational, mm. that isn't just, well, I'm the worship leader or I'm on the band and we're going to plan this thing. Right. And we're going to execute our plan. Right. Right. So there is a sense in which we are going to plan, mm -hmm. but it's maybe more like prayerful planning. Yes. And we're asking God to actually intervene on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, as we're putting things together. Yes. And he will. 
Absolutely. That's what I'm hearing in your your, your, your story is that God does intervene. Yeah, and absolutely. And he gives it direction and we begin to shape more and he gives it direction. Yeah. I just love that because it makes it makes the whole thing more relational. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And God, what do you have for us? What do you have for us? Not what do I have for us, but what do you have for us? And it's beyond me, you know? It's beyond the songs. It's what he has for this group of people at this time. some people who are listening to this and going, I believe all of this. I totally buy it. In fact, this stuff happens to me. But I don't, I don't feel like I can sort of like lead out in the room when it's Sunday morning, the way you're talking about, or I want to, but I'm just really afraid. Right. What would you tell them? Like God has maybe spoken to this person during the week or, or maybe during rehearsal, Sunday morning rehearsal, Mm -hmm. or maybe it's even right in the middle of the set. And now they know, but the whole band doesn't know. Right. And they're kind of nervous. Right. What, what would you tell them? Well, there's a few things. First of all, I would. I am not advocating that we go rogue against our pastor. <laughs> That's one thing. If you've got a tight schedule and you need to stick to it, yes, stick to it. God can still. God can use whatever. He doesn't waste anything, like Sarah said. Sarah no, Pemberton. Nothing is wasted. Nothing is wasted. Um, but if God is speaking to you, I one thing I do is I check it, especially. Like I run it past the pastors. Hey, I'm sensing this. What do you, what's going on here? If I get something in advance and I run it past our leadership team and I run it through or my co-leader, I've been feeling this and kind of I I check whatever things I can in advance. I I run through um, my co-leaders, my pastors, yeah, like and group all that. discernment, absolutely, which I is a hundred percent important, right? Yeah. Um, in the moment. Well, it also, just, group buy-in gives you more confidence. Right, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, well, not right. only not only does it keep us from screwing up, but it also gives us more confidence when other people are like, yeah, I, I feel like that's the Lord. Right. Yeah. And the other thing is, if you practice the songs at home and you've sat with them with the Lord, right? For me, you you feel moments. Like there's, some, there's something happening here, okay? So then you can go to your band at, on whenever it is and say, hey— I was feeling this thing here. I'm going to leave a little space here and we're going to see what happens. And you know, for me, half the time, I won't go to that thing, but I've made space for it if I need it. You know what I mean? Or maybe something totally different happens, but I've made space and I'll warn my band, I'm going to leave a little space here and see what happens. But I've also prepped that, right? So I've prepped it in advance during the week. I've prepped it with my team. And I made some space. So oftentimes, you know, God God will use that time and you can use it that way. The other thing I like about what you just said is if you've sort of played some songs during the week and you realize there's a moment in this song for me all week long, I just feel something extra and you give your band the warning, you, you could sort of extrapolate that into a larger principle of maybe it's time if you're a worship leader and you're listening to this conversation and you know that God gives you things and it's time for you to lead out in a new way, but you're a little bit afraid. Maybe the first step of leading out is to actually go and have this conversation with your pastor Yeah. to, to talk. Like as Melissa said, you know, we're not going to go rogue. Mm-hmm. So maybe we go and talk to our pastors and, and we just have a conversation that goes something like, Hey, is it cool with you? If occasionally, if I feel like God gives me something that we just take some sort of a left turn, uh, you know, maybe I'm going to pastor a room uh, in a specific way, we might we might do a thirty second prayer in the middle of worship as a group. Mm-hmm. Um, is that cool? Mm-hmm. And get some feedback from your pastor, and you're sort of like setting expectations, yeah, for what you're envisioning, and then what they expect, yeah. And then you're making that space, yeah. You know, yeah. wouldn't you think? I, I think that would be a really great way. I know as a pastor, yeah, if one of my worship leaders came to me like that, I would do a backflip. Yeah, absolutely. I love. I love worship leaders who are having courage. Mm -hmm. And I also love to feel like I'm a part of whatever they're wanting. Yeah. So that I can give my support. Right. And at the same time, stay out of the way. Right. And you know what we found like at our church is oftentimes the things that I'm getting 
Are the things that are happening in the intercessor room before church? Are the things that are happening in the message as is being prepped through the week? So if you're hearing from the Lord, it should all go together in what He's doing in this bigger picture. So it should be uh, awesome, yay, if it's working together. And that may or may not be the case, but it's it's uh, if you're communicating it, you can you can hear those same touch points. You can see what's going on, and and it's just a big a bigger one part of the bigger picture. Yeah, no, I think it's great. It's important. I think it's great. I would, um, I would say also because I'm just thinking about all the churches that that are kind of a part of our little group, you know. And I'm thinking of like tiny little right. church plants. I'm thinking of organic churches, mm-hmm. and I think like your church and my church, we fit very much into the organic church. Absolutely, mm-hmm. we're we're not super high production, right? We're we're very much. Let's find out how this thing goes together. But then I'm also thinking about our churches that are bigger, yeah, um, and maybe higher production, mm-hmm. and um, maybe just have a, a slightly different scale. Mm-hmm. Man, these conversations in terms of like your pastor team and your worship band, those have to happen. They have to in right? those places. They have to happen. Right. Right. You know, if you're at a if you're at a much bigger church where there's going to be a thousand or three thousand people come through that Sunday morning, mm-hmm. and worship is twenty-two minutes on the nose. Mm-hmm. Like you said a moment ago, I don't think that means wor- worship can't take some sort of a left turn, or that the Holy Spirit can't do some sort of powerful ministry in that right. moment. But but our communication has to be much wider right. in advance, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, it has to be. And I think though, with with the bigger production churches, you know, God uses it all. But I would assume there's a lot of opportunity in our week to week moment, like our day to day. So in small groups, in our pastor meetings, like to um, exercise this muscle, I think is important. So use it during the week in your quiet times with the Lord and grow it. You need to grow it and use it. And you need to also be able to grow it. Like when you're, when I'm going to that person who had the fuzz around him, like swimming fuzz, that was me practicing a muscle, right? And or working a muscle, a certain muscle. And and as I've practiced it and used it, it's grown. It's yeah, grown you're, and you're, I've been more confident in it. Yeah, you, you gain real strength in your prophetic gift. You do. And you have to practice it. So I would say use that the other opportunities for it. So in your small group settings, in your even your staff meetings, your prayer times with other people, I think you can use it there. Yeah, and it doesn't just have to be a Sunday morning. No, thing. it can it, it, use it. In those fact, other it shouldn't spe- be. It shouldn't be. You should practice it elsewhere. And and you'll have probably more time to be able to kind of exercise it, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm As we're sitting here talking, I'm thinking about when things don't work out great. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because I know, at least in my own personal history, one of the ways that I've grown in the prophetic or grown in hearing God and, and knowing what to do is literally just trial and error, mm-hmm. you know, like times when I just get things wrong. Right. Or I thought it was going to be one thing and I wasn't totally wrong, but it was actually in a way that I couldn't have imagined. Right. Yeah. Can you remember a story when when you thought you had something nailed and it was either totally not right or it ended up being right, but in a way you couldn't imagine? That happens all the time. Yeah. Like starting with the guy with the the swimmer fuss, the response was like, a, what? Like, But two years later something had, it was different. You know what I mean? So there's that. That happens to me all the time where I give a word and people look at me like I'm sort of crazy and they go, thanks. And then years later, something changes or it makes sense, right? So that happens all the time. Yeah, so we can't can't stop or change necessarily how we engage the prophetic based upon people's initial reactions. Right. Yeah. So there's that. Yeah. But also, so often even in like my prep during the week, I feel the Lord doing this and I'm going to maybe do this. Half the time that never happens. It's like, no, it didn't happen, you know? And so that's okay. Yeah. Or um, going back to like giving a word, right? Um, We have to give a word. Now, Now here's the thing. I wouldn't suggest just risking it all on a microphone all the time. Yeah. This is why you got to practice it, right? This is why it's really important to practice it in a very small setting, in a trusted setting where you've got accountability and people, the team, 
let's say the team, we've got the intercessors and the pastors, and I'm I'm running things past everyone. Well, that even happens in a small setting. When you're praying with someone, you practice it there while I'm praying for someone. That's where God speaks to you. It doesn't start on the stage. It starts way before the stage, yeah. way before. So you're practicing it in a group setting, praying for someone, and you're asking them, did, did that did that happen? And they may say no, mm-hmm. right? And that's okay. Yeah. You would let it go. Okay, that's okay. But hey, but here's the other part too. Even when they say no, it doesn't even mean that you're necessarily, it could mean you're wrong. Right. could mean you just heard wrong mm-hmm. or you didn't get it. Mm-hmm. Or it could mean you were right and, and th- the moment isn't here yet. Right. Or the way that you were anticipating it right. isn't here yet. Yeah. Right. But here's what we don't want to do. We don't want to push it on them because that's a word from the Lord for them. So that's between them and the Lord. It's not ours to do. So we can't beat people over the head with stuff either. You know, we got to well, give I mean, it. Here's the thing. I don't want to be beat over the head. No, I don't either. You right. Know, we just, we just treat people the way we want to be treated. Absolutely. And yeah. then you give it to them and then let, let it be between them and the Lord. And you know what? Keep praying for them Amen. as it comes up. Amen. I'll tell you one story. This is from many years ago. I was in college and I had a really profound prophetic experience that I don't have time to go into here, but I had a very, very profound prophetic experience driving home from Glasgow, Kentucky, which is like an hour from here. My mom had just been hit in a car accident and I thought she was going to die. It was like super dicey, you know? And in that moment of driving home alone, I have a profound prophetic experience. Mm. I see, I basically have an open vision. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I get home and I I realize, I don't know what just happened, but I have had some kind of an encounter with God. And it was very much a story. Like this, this prophetic experience was very story-like. Mm-hmm. And I shared it with a few people that I was going to church with. It seemed to resonate with them. And then I shared it with a couple of the professors in the theology department of the university I was going to. And oddly enough, it resonated with them, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And it's kind of funny that it would resonate with them because our church traditions were diverse enough that they would have good reason to not believe. (laughs) Anyway, long story short, there there was a group put together, like this group meeting on campus. And one of the professors asked me to share this vision that I'd had. And then, then he asked me, what do you think it means, right? And as soon as I started telling everybody what it meant, it resonated deeply. But but part of what ends up happening in, at the end of this story is that I I guess in some ways I had received something from the Lord and, and then I communicated it to people. They could feel some of whatever it was that I experienced. But the thing that I really, really missed was I was missing the timing, mm. if that makes sense. Yep. So, so – I'd had this experience that was so personal, so powerful, and so present. Mm -hmm. I felt like God was saying, this is going to happen today. Right. Like we're in, we are in whatever this thing is. We're in it now. Mm -hmm. Long story short, this is something that took years Mm. to happen, right? And and I had a few more experiences in my early 20s with prophetic visionary kind of encounters Mm -hmm. that were very similar. And one of the things I had to learn back to that trial and error thing was Mm -hmm. that oftentimes I would get a word from God. It would actually be a right word from God. Mm -hmm. It would be, uh, it would be true. Other people would confirm that it is true. And the thing that I would consistently get wrong is I would think it's now and God would be showing me things that would take five or 10 years. Yeah. So one of the things I've learned, and I've only learned this through trial and error Mm -hmm. and having to, you know, have some moments that were where where I was thinking it was going to be in this moment or tomorrow. Mm-hmm. I've learned that one of the things that God does to me is often oftentimes if I'm having a really big Holy Spirit encounter or Holy Spirit prophetic experience, chances are I might be seeing something that's a decade away. Right. Or more. Right. Is that funny how you have to learn that though? Yeah. You know, like you have to learn it. And I think for me, I'm the personality type. I'm real cautious. Like I just, so I'm a slow mover, but not everyone's like that. So a lot of people will get something and dive right in. I think for me, I had to, I had to um, 
take the obedience route and like, I have a thing right now, so I have to say it right now because I am so cautious that, uh, oh, I'll just wait and I'll wait forever and never do it. But I had to actually, in order to practice it, I had to step out more because I come from more of a timid kind of background type thing. Not everyone's like that. But the whole idea. I'm not timid. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so some I've, people have I've to, learn. to learn. I've had to learn the opposite. Like I, I, I have oftentimes given things and even seen God move like profoundly. And then in the most, most intense experiences I've had, I've realized, oh, through only through failure, not even total failure either, but just trial and error. God was speaking to me, but it's like some other time. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think for me then, I'm now at that where I go. I've still like only recently had to go, okay, wait, is this for now or not? And you don't always know. You no. really don't know. You can only do, all you can do is like maybe give it. And, and the, in in an atmosphere of trying to be obedient and partner with the Holy Spirit and give what you have, the only appropriate response here is to, I think, is the heart posture with which you give it, right? Right. Humility, openness to other interpretations, uh, Confessing that you could even be wrong. Right. right? Absolutely. Like we just hold everything really loosely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I would there was a a year where I was having dreams and it was for a, like other people. Uh, you know, actually a lot of people in the vineyard just that weren't anywhere around me. And some of them it was like, oh, this is what's happening in my life. And because I'd say, I had this dream and they were kind of weird, but you know, it would relate in some. Nope. <laughs> you know? Yeah, but here's the other thing. When they say no, it doesn't necessarily mean it wasn't from the Lord. They may not just be, they may not be in the moment yet. Right. That's so true. It's yeah. so true. It can take time for it sure. Does. But you gotta you gotta try. You Trial gotta, and error. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I love that. I love it. You model it so well. It's fun. Yeah, it's great. It's fun being a part of what God's doing. Be like, oh, I get to play too. That's Everyone right. gets to play. That's right. Dang, Melissa. <laughs> I thought we were going to get a little further than this, but we're not going to. I know. Yeah. Darn. Hey, I tell you what, we'll just have to pick up this podcast again sometime. Okay. Yeah. I'm in. Because there's another subject that I want to talk about with you. Yes. But we'll just save that for another day. Is that okay? okay. Yeah. Fine with me. Hey, um, let's do the thing we always do on The Ferment. Okay. Can we just wrap this up with you telling us a time that you experienced great joy? Yes. Yes, please. Okay. So... My husband and my kids are my delight. They are my great joy. That's right. But I want to tell you about a different That's great. moment. Um, so recently in the last year and a half, our our pastor, Wade, shout out to Wade and Lori Verrier, Vineyard Fullerton. We've done nights of music out in the city. And it's a time. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. It's a time where you, so we do theme nights. So 80s night, 90s night, 70s. Love yeah, songs. but where do you do this at? So we do it at a place called Roscoe's in downtown, the middle of our city, downtown what is Roscoe's? Fullerton. Roscoe's is a dive bar. So when you say we're going to play at Roscoe's, the people respond to me with, "Oh, the place where everyone gets drunk." Yes. Okay. Yep. That's where we're going to be. Yeah. So you guys are doing this to sort of like reach out to your city. We do. Yeah. So we go and we do music for three hours and the, the church comes and we can invite our friends. We can invite people. It's a really easy bridge. Just come hang out with us. And we changed the atmosphere of the bar where everyone gets drunk and people don't know what to do with themselves. The bartenders yes. are like, why are you guys so nice? It's awesome. So... Um, we have a family band that plays. So Scott, my husband, my dad, my uncle plays bass, and then we get some others with us. And we've been playing these theme nights and we'll do a little bit of the night, not the whole night, the whole church participates, Yes, which is amazing. And we do a night and I will tell you, I have found a new calling in life <laughs> in doing cover tunes. <laughs> cover tunes at the my, local dive bar. It is my great joy. We did a 70s night. And it was, we did play that funky music, White Boy. Okay. And I'm playing it with my dad and my uncle, who yes. are funky white boys. Yes. And Casey came up, came up and joined us, yes. another funky white boy. Yes. And we did the song, I'm telling you, some other version of Melissa escaped. And really? I'm free. I am free now. It was so much fun. Yeah. And I'm I'm living high life. It's By just, the way, Melissa has her hands. I have She's my doing hands lots up. of hand things right now. <laughs> lots her hands are everywhere right now. <laughs> Oh, I could get up and dance. Yeah. <laughs> it brings me great joy. And I get to do it with my family. Yeah. And my kids get to hear us practicing. And they are getting those old songs in their hearts. And mm -hmm. they're singing them around the house. But really just, uh, well, it's a long story. It's just brought me great joy. You know what I hear in that as well, just to bring this full circle? 
when we first started talking, all of your story was connected to playing music with your dad and your husband, your uncle, all these guys at the church and mm-hmm. stuff. And then this last little story is the same, isn't it? It's so true. Yeah, it's, it that's, is. That's, that's where that's where you find the joy. It is. And I have I I think the thing with doing music, I would recommend this to all musicians, I think. Mm-hmm. I would. Is doing music outside of the church. It just works a different muscle than in the church. And so I am free outside to do something that I don't normally get to do. I'm completely free. And there and I get to do things that I, I experience great joy in being almost like, it's like you're fully alive mm-hmm. because, and, and I'm called to worship leading, but there's something so different and, and so free that it, I have grown as a musician so much in, in being able to play these songs outside and play these different new songs, right? Um, that there's a different part of myself that has come out and I just feel like, fully alive. Yeah. It's a great story. So I recommend it to everyone. Yeah, Go everybody, get out and play music. And everybody needs to follow Casey and Melissa's Instagram so that you can see the stories yes. and see the post from these moments. And Darren Barrier. Yes. DV. He's always playing that SG. So good. That's good. So fun. Well, Melissa, thanks for your stories. Oh, so thanks fun. Thanks for coming on The Ferment. Thank you. This All was right. fun. High fives, everybody. High five. Peace. Hi, everyone. This is Melissa Keller, Events Director for Vineyard Worship. If you've been enjoying the podcast, I've got a couple of ways you could really help us. First of all, review the podcast on iTunes or the podcast platform of your choice. This helps more people find us. Also, connect with us on social media, Instagram at The Ferment Podcast and Twitter at Fermentcast. Thanks for listening. See you next time.